This reading is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Stillwater's Revival Books is online at www.puritandownloads.com. A Desperate Case How to Meet It. A sermon delivered on Sunday morning, January 10, 1864, by Charles H. Spurgeon at the Metropolitan Tabernacle of Newington, England. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say to you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer, and fasting, Matthew seventeen, nineteen to twenty one. The narrative of which our text forms a part describes a scene which took place immediately after the transfiguration of our Lord. Now, not to divorce it, therefore, from its connection, let us glance at the antecedents of the case, that nothing may be lost by negligence, or that peradventure we may gain something by meditation. How great the difference between Moses and Christ. When Moses had been forty days upon the mountaintop, he underwent a kind of transfiguration, so that his face shone with exceeding brightness when he came down among the people, and he was obliged to put a veil over his face, for they could not bear to look upon his glory. Not so our Savior he had been really transfigured with a greater glory than Moses could ever know. And yet, as he came down from the mount, whatever radiance shone upon his face, it's not written that the people could not look upon him, but rather they were amazed and running to him, they saluted him. The glory of the law repelled for the majesty of holiness and justice drive the awed spirits away from God. But the greater glory of Jesus attracts. Though he is holy and just and righteous too, yet blended with these there is so much of truth and grace that sinners run to Jesus amazed at his goodness, attracted by the charming fascination of his love, and they salute him, become his disciples, and take him to be their Lord and Master. Some of you may be just now blinded by the dazzling brightness of the law of God. You feel its claims on your conscience, but you cannot keep it in your life. It's too high. You cannot attain to it. Not that you find fault with the law. On the contrary, it commands your profoundest esteem. Still, you're in no wise drawn by it to God you're rather hardened in your heart. And you may be verging towards the inference of desperation. As it is impossible for me to earn salvation by the works of the law, I'll just continue in my sins. Oh, poor heart. Turn thine eye away from Moses with all his repelling splendor and look to Jesus, crucified for sinful men. Behold his flowing wounds and thorn-crowned head. He is the Son of God. Therein he is greater than Moses. He bear the wrath of God, and therein he shows more of God's justice than Moses' broken tablets could ever do. Look thou to him, and as thou feelest the attraction of his love, fly to his arms and be saved. How different the Spirit of Moses and Jesus. When Moses comes down from the mountain, it's to purge the camp. He seems to grasp the fiery sword. He breaks the golden calf. He smites the idolaters. But when Jesus comes down from the mountain, he finds a strife in the camp, as Moses did. He finds his own apostles worsted and beaten, just as Aaron had been defeated by the clamors of the people. But he has not a word of cursing. There's a 
gentle rebuke, O faithless and perverse generation, how shall I be with you so long? How long shall I suffer you? His actions are actions of mercy. No breaking in pieces, but healing. No cursing, but blessing. Love sits smiling on his brow as he touches the poor wretch who is almost dead with diabolical possession restores him to life and health. Go you then to Jesus. Leave the law and your own self-righteousness, for these can do nothing but curse you. Fly to Jesus, for be you whomsoever you may. There are pardons on his lips. There are blessings in his hands. There's love in his heart, and he will not disdain to receive even you. How much of condescension there is in the manner of Christ. Our Lord, we have told you, had been very glorious on the mountain's top with, with Moses and Elijah. And yet, when he comes down into the midst of the crowd, he doth not disdain the cry of the poor man, nor refuse to touch him who was possessed with a devil. Observe my master's condescension, for he deigns attention. And yet his manner softens into pity, Presently it melts into a gracious sympathy, as if this was the only channel through which his peerless power could flow. And then remember, he is the same today as he was then. Now, though he reigns exalted high, his love is still as great. He's willing now to receive sinners, as when it was said of him, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them and just as ready to receive you, poor sinners, as when he was called the friend of publicans and sinners. Come to him. Bow at his feet. His love invites you still. Believe that the transfigured and glorified Jesus is still a loving Savior, willing to pardon and forgive. Once again, what choice instruction there is in history. After Jesus had been absent for some time, he came back. You may ask for what purpose he had retired. Evidently, he went up into the mountain to pray. It was while he was praying, and that I make no doubt fasting likewise, that the fashion of his countenance changed by his own personal devotion and by the Father's special revelation. He had thus come back, as it were, with great refreshment to carry on his ministry. Hence we become witnesses of a marvelous power which he immediately showed forth and of no less remarkable counsel which he spoke to his disciples when they felt their own weakness. Thus we have before us on our text a peculiar case, a patient who utterly baffled the skill of all his disciples, healed at once by the great master. And we have a reason given why the apostles themselves were not able to deliver him. Let us look for a little time at this very sad case. Not so singular either, methinks, but that we may find the round about us. Then let us notice the scene around the case. The father, the, the disciples, the scribes. And then afterwards we shall joyfully observe the Savior's coming into the midst and and deciding all the difficulty. And lastly, we shall attend to the reason he gives in private to his disciples why they, before his coming, were utterly powerless to achieve the work. First we have before us a very peculiar case. It appears that the disciples had cast out devils of all sorts. Wherever they had gone, Heretofore, this was their uniform testimony. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. But now well, they're baffled. They seem to have encountered a devil of the worst kind. There are grades in devilry as there are in human sin. All men are evil, but all men are not alike evil. All devils are full of sin, but they are not all sinful to the same degree. Do we not read in Scripture then, Goeth he, and taketh unto him seven other spirits more wicked than himself? It may be uh, there is a gradation in the wickedness of devils, and perhaps also in their power to fulfill their wicked impulses. 
we can scarcely think that all devils are Satan's. There seems to be one chief arch spirit, one great Diabolos, who is an accuser of the brethren, one mighty Lucifer who fell down from heaven and has become the prince of the powers of darkness. In all his hosts, it is probable that there is not his like. He stands first and chief of those fallen morning stars. The rest of the spirits may stand in different grades of wickedness, a hierarchy of hell. This poor wretch seems to have been possessed of one of the worst, most potent and violent and virulent of these evil spirits. I believe, brethren, that here we have a picture of a certain class of individuals who are not only desperately sinful, but subject to extraordinary impulses which carry them to infernal lengths and depths of infamy. They are incapable of restraint, a terror to their kinfolk, a misery to themselves. All men are sinful, as I've said before, but the power of depravity in some men is much stronger than in others at least if it be not intrinsically stronger, yet it certainly has manifestations in some which we have never perceived in common among men. Let's try and pick out the case according to the narrative. How frequently, dear friends, too frequently, alas, have we seen young people who have answered to the description here given. They've had a precocity of wickedness, When Jesus asked the father, how long has he been this way? The answer was, of a child. Uh, I remember having once known such a child over whom uh, paroxysms of passion came, in which his face would, would turn black. When he was able to run about and was sent to a public school, a flint stone, a club, a brick bat, anything which might come next to his hand, he would throw without a moment's thought at anyone who vexed him. His knife would be drawn from his pocket and opened in an instant. The young assassin has often been prevented from stabbing others by a careful hand and watchful eye which guarded him. We've noticed this, I say, in the very young. They begin to lie early and to thieve soon. And the young lip even assays to swear. Well, the anxious mother cannot understand where the child could have learnt it. You have protected such a child from contamination and seem to shut him in and girdle him about with holy influences. And yet, in these desperate instances, as soon as ever the child could know the right from the wrong, he has deliberately chosen the wrong with a violence of self-will and recklessness of consequences altogether unusual. Some such cases we have seen. Oh, may God grant it and never be your lot or mine to be the parents of such children. Yet such there have been and such men there are who have grown up now and the youthful passions of their childhood have become developed. And you may find them with the low forehead and dark scowling eye, if you will, in our prison houses. Or if you see them in the streets, you may hopefully wish that they may be in prison ere long, for they are unsafe abroad. Of a child they seem to have been possessed with the chief of devils and to have been carried captive by him at his will. This lad uh, seems also to have been afflicted with what is here called lunacy, which was indeed only a form of epilepsy. He was constantly subjected, it seems, to epileptic fits. I think we can hardly understand lunacy to mean anything short of occasional madness. Attacks of such outrageous violence would come upon him that there would be no enduring him. He would then dash himself into the fire, or if water were near, he would attempt self-destruction by plunging into it. We've met with persons of his kind, perfectly outrageous, beyond all command, when fits of evil came upon them, I will, I will instance cases which I have observed. I know a man now. now he may be here this morning. If, if he is, you'll recognize his own portrait. At times he's as reasonable as anyone I could wish to associate with. He enjoys listening to the word of God. He is, in some respects, an amiable, excellent, and respectable man. But occasionally, 
fits of drunkenness come upon him, in which he is perfectly powerless under the influence of that demon. And while it lasts, it matters not even when he knows he is wrong, a thousand angels could not drag him from it. He's thrown into the water of self-destruction, and he will continue in it. You may urge him and reason with him, and you may think, oh, oh how, how often some have thought who love him. He'll never do that again. He's too sensible a man. Oh, he's been too well taught. Uh, the word of God has had such an effect upon him that he will never do it again, yet he does. He repeats the old paroxysms and has done for 20 or 30 years. And if he lives, unless sovereign grace prevent it, he'll die a drunkard, as sure as he is a living man, and he'll go from his drink to damnation. Another case from which I likewise draw from life, the man is kind, tender, generous, generous to a fault. He has a home. He had one, I ought to say. He had a home, and he was the light of it, and no one ever suspected him, that is, in his better times, of any grievous faults. Uh, but sometimes, and this has been concealed by many an indulgent friend, sometimes an attack of lasciviousness comes upon him, and at such seasons it matters not what the temptation may be, nor how foul the vice may be, the man runs into it. If you should meet him in the street and talk with him and argue with him, it would be all time and labor thrown away. Nay, I've known him break up his home and cross the sea to go to another land that he might indulge his vile passions without rebuke or the restraint of associating with former friends. He will come back again, broken-hearted, wondering that he ever could be such a fool, but he will go again. It's in him. The devil is in him. And unless God casts it out, he'll do the same again, deliberately choosing his own damnation. Though he knows it, yet so possessed of the love of sin is he, that when the fit comes upon him, this diabolical epilepsy, he falls into sin with his whole might and power. I might go on describing cases of the kind, but you will not need that I should picture any more. It could only be to vary the different forms of sin. However, uh, let me try once more. A lad had as good a father as a child could have. He was bound apprentice. It became whispered in a few weeks that little monies were missing. The father was very grieved. So indeed was the master, and the matter was quietly hushed up. A little while after, the same thing occurred. The indentures were cancelled, and nothing more was said of it, but the father was sorely perplexed. He looked out for some other situation for the boy where he might, uh, perhaps, recover his character. After a time, it was precisely the same again. Bad companions had got a hold of him, or rather, he had become a ringleader among other bad companions. Well, something else must be tried. It was tried. He's had 20 situations, and they've all been thrown up from the very same cause. And now, what think you is his treatment of his parents? Instead of being grateful for the repeated kindness and long-suffering shown to him, he'll break out sometimes into such dreadful passions that even the lives of his parents are scarcely safe. When he has been in his old haunts a little more than usual, he's really so terrible a being that his mother who loves him and who weeps over him would almost as soon see a fiend from hell as see him. For when he comes home, everything goes wrong. Confusion. It's in the house. Terror in every heart. He acts precisely as if he were a madman. They've said, send him to Australia or send him to America where they do send many of that sort. But but if he goes there, he'll turn up sooner or later at the foot of the gallows. He's desperately set on evil. Nothing turns him aside. He tears and foams at the mouth with passion. His whole heart goes forth outrageously after 
after anything like vice, and there appears to be not one redeeming trait in his character. Or if there be, it only seems to be subjected to the power of his lusts. He devises means to be more mighty, to do mischief in the world. What dreadful cases these are. Wherefore am I talking of them? Dear friends, I've taken them because it has been laying upon my heart to encourage and comfort you who are constrained to carry a daily cross in having such relations and such children as these. It's one of the heaviest afflictions which can come upon you. In the case before us, the child was both deaf and dumb. Now, not, I suppose, through any organic effect, but through the epilepsy and the satanic possession. So often we have seen children. Uh, shall I look them in the face this morning as I stand here? Well, they are no children now who are positively deaf to all spiritual sounds. Well, they've been pleaded with, but it's in vain. They know the truth. They know the whole truth but they do not know the power of it. They are never absent from family prayer, nor in any prayer are they ever forgotten by their parents. They come to this place. They attend our classes. They go to revival services. Now and then there's something like a little emotion, but it does not come to much. They're precisely similar to the deaf adder, which cannot be charmed. Charm we never so wisely. Others of the family... Excuse me. Have been converted. Nearly all the household has now been brought to Christ. Now, Lydia has had her heart opened. God has been much pleased to call young Timothy, but but this one remains. And after much anxiety, much effort, much labor, no good has been achieved. The adamant seems as soft as their heart. In the ear of the deaf as much alive to rebuke as their conscience. This again is a, a very sad case. Now, I meet sometimes too with cases of another kind. Persons who are beset with very high doctrine. Who've got the devil in them. And puffing up their fleshly minds with a vain conceit of sound understanding. And degrading their carnal profession with a loathsome impurity of heart and life. You'll talk with them. They'll tell you they wish to be saved. They'd give their right arm to be saved. But it is not in their power. You bid them believe in Jesus. They have no sense, they tell you, of the need of a Savior. They're not in a fit state to believe. When God's time comes, the thing will occur. Oh, they love high doctrine. They'll hear nothing else but it. But then their Sunday, if there's a temptation which comes across their path, will be spent anywhere but in the worship of God. During the week, they give way to all sorts of sins. Whatever temptation comes, they go after it. The comfort they get from their religion, which they wrap about them like a cloak, is this that no minister speaks the truth except one or two, that the truth is fatalism, that all they have to do is to be carried along like dead inanimate logs down the stream, and that they're not at all responsible, or if they are responsible, it's merely to maintain with unflinching hardihood their own crude sentiments. I've seen some of these people. Good people in their own way, too, of, of whom I have thought that the conversation of drunkards was more helpful and hopeful than theirs. For that damnable fatalism, which by some is put instead of the predestination of the scriptures, has locked them up, put them in an iron cage. And so they are beyond the reach of help, going on in their sin, rejecting the gospel of Christ, while assaying to be connoisseurs of its choicest mysteries. Now, brothers and sisters, why are such cases as these permitted? Why doth the Lord allow the devil thus to fill the soul with sin? I think it is first to show that there is a reality of sin. If we were all moral and outwardly respectable, we should begin to think sin was but a fancy. These daring sinners show the reality of it. 
is to manifest the reality also of divine grace. For when these are saved, then it is we wonder and we are compelled to say, there's something in this. If such a hard, iron nature yet melts before the power of divine love, there must be a majesty in it. It's to humble us too, to throw us on our back. Let us see how utterly powerless human agency is. When you cannot get in the thin end of the wedge, much less the whole wedge, and when the plowshare breaks on the edge of a hard rock, when the edge of the sword turns against the armor, then it is to draw yourself out of self to God. You see, it's a deadly evil where only omnipotence can help. Your soul says, Lord, put out thine arm. Now do it and the glory shall be thine. This is probably the chief reason. It's in order that God may get great glory to himself. He lets the devil have it all his own way. There, he says, pick your own ground. Fight in your own territory. Maneuver in your own way. And with a word, I'll crush your power. He gives Satan great advantage. Let's him entrench himself firmly in the soul from youth up so that the victory may be splendid to the greatest degree. Well, we have thus before us now for our sorrowful contemplation the case of one whose disease mocks the physician, laughs at all human endeavors and defies the watchful care of mild and gentle treatment to mitigate its force or ameliorate its fearful symptoms. Now we turn with a passing glance to look at the the scene around. The company is made up of five sorts of people. Uh, There are the scribes, cynics, methinks, to a man. We told you so, we told you so, they say. Your master pretended to give you power to cast out devils. No such thing. You cannot cast out devils. Those whom you healed were not truly possessed. Little enough was ever the matter with them, and and so they got better. They were fanciful, and they believed you through enthusiasm. The dupes of credulity, your incantations, bewitched them, and so they got better. But you cannot cast out a devil. You cannot cast that devil out. Now then, says one of the scribes to Andrew, cast it out. Come on, Philip. Try what you can do. And inasmuch as after all trying, the devil would not go out, ah, (laughs) just so. They're imposters. There's nothing in it. Just recall it, friends, to your own memories. Have you you not met and seen men of that kind? Ah, yes, they say the gospel converts one sort of people, such as always go to places of worship, the more intelligent and respectable of the community. But you see, it's no good in these tough cases, these hardened ones. It it can't touch them. They're beyond its power. Aha, they say, where is the boasted might of this great physician? He can heal your finger aches. (laughs) But he does not know how to make these foul diseases fly. Well, then here is the poor father, all dejected. I brought him to you. I I knew you did cast out devils, and I, I thought you could cast my son's devil out, and, and he'd be healed. I'm disappointed in you all. Yet I do think your master can do it, but I'm not sure that even he can. If such excellent apostles as you are have tried so hard and have failed, I do not think there can be any chance for me. I'm I'm full of unbelief. Oh, I wish I had never brought my child here at all to make a public spectacle of him, that he might be a witness to your failures. Yeah, that's the, that's the poor father. Perhaps that poor father is here this morning. And he's saying, yeah, I, I do believe, but... But still, I'm full of unbelief. I've, I've brought my daughter. I, I've brought my child under the sound of the word. I've prayed. I've wrestled with God in prayer. My child is not saved. Uh, I've brought my husband, says one good woman. But he's just as full of Satan as he ever was. <laughs> I've just got to give up in despair. 
And then there are the disciples. And they look pitiable indeed. Well, they say, we, we don't know how to account for it. We, we can't tell you how it is. We've, we've said the same in, in this case that we were wont to say in others. Why? When I went abroad and, and just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command thee to come out of him. The unclean spirit always did come out in every other case. I, I can't comprehend this. I, I give up. We all must give it up, says the apostles. Now, for some unknown cause, this seems to be quite out of the catalog of cases which we are commissioned to cure. And, and so we sometimes hear dejected ministers. After preaching long at such hard shells as these, they say, well, we can't understand it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Oh, it, it must be that, that these are foreordained unto damnation. We'll give it up. Ooh, that is how unbelieving ministers talk, or at least the, uh, the most part of ministers in their season of misgiving and chagrin. Then there's the general crowd. Now, they are neither this way nor that. They say they will see fair. Come, clear the ring out. If, if Jesus Christ be not an imposter, if he be God, certainly he can heal this poor man. Now here's the test and the ordeal. If that man be not healed, we, says the crowd, will not believe. But if he be, then we will believe that Jesus Christ is sent of God. Oh, dear friends, how often we have thought of those very hard cases in this way. There are hundreds of undecided people looking on and saying, Ah, if so and so were converted, then I should say there was something in it. If truly we could have a new heart and a right spirit, then I too would turn to God with full purpose of heart. There was the, the fifth party here. That was the devil himself. Oh, how triumphant was he. Ah, he seemed to say, try your exorcism. Go on with your words. Preach at him. Pray at me. Weep over me. Do what you will. You cannot get me out. There he seems to stand entrenched within the stronghold of a poor, tortured heart. Do your best. And do your best. Do your worst. I'm not afraid of you. I've got this man. I'll keep him. I have so fixed myself in him that no power shall ever be able to heal him. And so we seem to hear that, that vile shriek of hell over some men. Yes, saith he, I, I will trust him to go into Spurgeon's tabernacle. I know the thousands there have felt the power of the Holy Ghost in making new men of them, but this is a case I can trust. There's nothing that will ever touch him. The great hammer has knocked the chains off of many, but it cannot touch his chains. They're harder than iron. I have no fear for him. And perhaps he's gloating his thoughts now with the torments of the man in another world. Ah, thou foul fiend, if, if our master should come here this morning, thou should sing another tune. If he should say, come out of him, thou foul spirit, thou go back howling to thy vile den. For his voice can do what our voice never could have done. And may we not easily realize such a scene enacted in this congregation. You have the scoffers. You have the anxious parent, the ministry confessedly powerless in the matter, the crowds looking on, and the devil rejoicing that such cases are quite beyond human strength. What more can you want to vivify the picture before your imagination? But look, the third point, the master comes. Ah, the master comes. Forthwith the scene changes. The lieutenants and the captains who began the battle didn't understand the art of war. Uh, they were precipitate and hasty. The right wing was broken. The left began to reel. The center almost fails. The trumpets of the adversary begin to sound to victory. Here they come, their dread artillery in front. What will become of the army now? Hold. Hold. What is that I see? A cloud of dust. Who comes galloping there? It's the commander-in-chief. 
What are you at? Says he. What are you at? And in a moment he sees this is not the way to fight. He comprehends the difficulties of the case in an instant. Forward there. Forward there. Backward there. The scale is turned. The mere presence of the commander-in-chief has changed the whole face of the field. And now, ye adversaries, you may turn your backs and fly. It was so in Jesus' case exactly. His lieutenants and captains, the apostles, had lost the day. He comes into the field, comprehends the state of the case. Bring him hither to me, he says. And the poor wretch, foaming and tormented, is brought to him. And he says, come out of him. Thou unclean spirit, the thing is done, and the victory achieved. The undecided receive Christ as a prophet. The scoffers' mouths are shut. The trembling father rejoices, and the poor demoniac is cured. And yet, when Jesus Christ came to cure this poor man, he was in as bad a state as he well could be. Nay, the very presence of the Savior seemed to make it worse. As soon as ever the devil perceived that Christ was come, he began to rend and tear his poor victim. As quaint old Fuller says, like a bad tenant whose lease is out, he hates the landlord, and so he does all the damage he can because he just got notice to quit. Often just before men are converted, they are worse than ever. There's an unusual display of their desperate wickedness. For then the devil hath great wrath, now that his time is short. The struggles of this child are appalling. The devil seemed as if he would kill him before he would be healed. And after great paroxysms of the most frightful kind, the poor youth, laid upon the ground, pale, still as a corpse, insomuch that many said, he is dead. Oh, it's just the same with many conversions of these desperate sinners. Their convictions are so terrible. Frequently the work of the devil within them, keeping them from Christ, is so furious that you give up all hope. You say, that man will be driven mad. And those acute feelings, the intense agony of his spirit, will rob him of all mental power. And then in abject persecution, he will die in his sin. Ah, dear friends, this again is only a piece of Satan's infamy. He knew, and knew right well, that Christ would set that poor young man free. And therefore he sets upon him with all his might to torment him while he may. Have I any such desperate case among my hearers this morning? One who has been as a son of Belial among the children of men. Is the devil tormenting you today? Do you feel tempted to commit suicide? Are you urged to some freak of yet greater sin in order to drown your griefs and strangle your conscience? Oh, poor soul, do no such thing. For my master will soon stoop over you and take you by the hand and lift you up and your comfort shall begin because the unclean spirit is cast out. Ah, he means to destroy me, says the soul under conviction. Nay, soul. God does not destroy those whom he convinces of sin. Men do not plow fields which they have no intention to sow. If God plows you with conviction, he will sow you with gospel comfort. And you shall bring forth a harvest of his glory. As a woman at her work first plies the needle with its sharp prick and then draws the thread after it, so in your case the sharpness of sorrow for sin will be speedily followed by the silver thread of joy and peace in believing. Ah, mark it. Mark this. The vision just now, up there on the mountain of glory, resolved itself into Jesus only. His peerless radiance eclipsed every other. So too it is Jesus only down there in the valley. His matchless grace can encounter no rival. Keep this forever in your mind's eye. It is the Master who did it all. His appearance on the scene removed all difficulties. In such extreme cases there will be, and, and there must be, a most eminent display of God's power. And that power may be unassociated with means. Under any circumstances it will be the Lord alone doing it to the praise and glory of His grace.
And number four, we come to the last and perhaps the most important part of the sermon. The riddle is perplexing. Why could we not cast him out? Let the Master tell us the reasons why these cases thwart our power. The Savior said it was for want of faith. Want of faith. No man may expect to be the means of the conversion of a sinner without having faith, which leads him to believe that the sinner will be converted. Such things may occur, but it is not the rule. If I can preach in faith that my hearers will be saved, they will be saved. If I have no faith, God may honor his word, but it will be in in no great degree. Certainly he will not honor me. Abandoned sinners, if converted by means, are usually brought under the power of divine grace through ministers of great faith. Have you observed uh, there were persons who heard all the small fry of the Whitfieldian age? They had listened to this preacher and to that preacher. Under whom were they converted? Under Mr. Whitfield, because Mr. Whitfield was a man of masterly faith. He believed that the lost could be reclaimed, that the worst diseases could be healed, the most heinous, abandoned, profligate, blasphemous sinners could be saved. He preached to them as if he expected the deaf would be charmed by the gospel melody and the dead would be quickened at the commanding call of the great Redeemer's name. At Surrey Chapel over yonder in Rowland Hill's day, some of the grossest blackguards and biggest scamps who ever infested London were saved. Why? Because Rowland Hill believed the gospel for big sinners believed the fact of big sinners being converted. The respectable people of his day said, oh yes, it's only a tag, rag, and bobtail who go to hear Mr. Hill. Just so, said Mr. Hill, and welcome tag, and welcome rag, and, and welcome bobtail. They're the very people that I want. What's the good of such people as they are going to hear the gospel? Why does Mr. Hill try to preach to harlots and thieves, they said. They're just... The very people, said Mr. Hill. I believe that these people can be saved. It was want of faith in the others. For if a man have faith as a grain of mustard seed, let it be ever so little, yet if it is true, it is mighty in proportion to its power. Mr. Hill had the power of faith, and he was the means of the conversion of very great sinners. A few years ago it was utterly hopeless to try and reclaim fallen daughters of sin. But a few men had faith that it could be done. And it has been done. And I will now make bold to say that if there be a great sinner here, such as I tried to describe just now, some gross case of infernal possession, if that person be not saved, it's it's for the want of faith in our case. If we have brought that person before God and have not been anxious about his salvation and God has not heard that prayer, it's because we could not believe it possible such a case could be saved. If God gives you the power to believe that any soul will be saved, it will be saved. There's no doubt about that. Still our Savior added, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What does he mean by that? I believe he meant that in these very special cases, ordinary preaching of the word will not avail. Ordinary prayer will not suffice. There must be an unusual faith. And to get this, there must be an unusual degree of prayer. And to get that prayer up to the right point, there must be, in many cases, fasting as well. No doubt there's something special about the admonition to prayer from the association in which it stands. One sort of Christian will use formal supplications. And the petitions they ask are founded upon a sense of propriety without any glow of feeling. Another sort will wait for the Spirit to move them. And when certain impulses stimulate their minds, they rejoice in a sense of liberty. Yet I show you a more excellent way. There be those who watch unto prayer, wait before the Lord, seek his face, and exercise patience till they get an audience. 
such disciples continue in their retirement until they have an experience of access for which they crave. And what is fasting for? Now that seems to be the difficult point. It's evidently accessory to the peculiar continuance in prayer practiced oftentimes by our Lord and advised by Him to His disciples. Not a kind of religious observance in itself meritorious, but a habit when associated with the exercise of prayer, unquestionably helpful. I'm not sure whether we have lost a very great blessing in the Christian church by giving up fasting. It was said there was superstition in it. But as an old divine says, we'd better have a spoonful of superstition than a porringer full of gluttony. Martin Luther, whose body, like some others, was of a gross tendency, felt as some of us do, that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. In another sense, that the, then the apostles meant it. And he used to fast frequently. He says his flesh was wont to grumble dreadfully at abstinence, but fast he would. For he found that when he was fasting, it quickened his praying. There's a treatise by an old Puritan called The Soul Fattening Institution of Fasting. And he gives us his own experience that during a fast, he has felt more intense eagerness of soul in prayer than he had ever done at any other time. Some of you, dear friends, may get to the boiling point in prayer without fasting. I do think that others cannot. And probably if we sometimes set apart a whole day for prayer, for a special object, we should at, at first feel ourselves dull and lumpish and heavy. Then let us resolve, well, I shall not go down to my dinner. I shall stop here. I feel anxious for a praying frame of mind, and I will keep alone. And if when the time for evening meal came on, we should say, I, I feel a little craving of hunger, but I will satisfy them with some very slender nutriment, a piece of bread or something of the kind, and I will continue in prayer. I think that very likely towards evening our prayers would become more forcible and vehement than in any other part of the day. We do not exactly recommend this for those who are weak. There are some men with little or no encumbrance of flesh about them, but others of us of a heavy make and with sluggishness for a temptation, have to cry out because we are rather like stones on the ground than, than birds in the air. And to such, I think we can venture to recommend it from the words of Christ. At any rate, I can suppose a father here, setting apart a day of prayer, going on wrestling with God without any intermission, pleading with Him till, as it was said of the famous martyr of Brussels, he would so pray that he forgot everything except his prayer. And when they came to call him to food, he, he made no answer. For he had got out of all earthly things in his wrestling with the angel that he could not think of anything besides. Such a man, taking up the case of a gross sinner, I believe, would be the means of that sinner's conversion. And the reason why some are never brought to Christ is speaking after the manner of men because we have not got the qualified to deal with them. For this kind goeth not out, save with prayer and fasting. When we have prayed and have reached the point of true faith, then the sinner is saved by the mighty power of God, and Christ is glorified. Methinks I have some in this house who are ready to say, Well, if such be the case, I will try it. I will take the Master at his word. Brother, brother, if half a dozen of us join together, it might be better. Nay, if, if two agree as touching any one thing, it would be done. Let some of us put it to the test upon some big sinner and see whether it does not come true. I think I may fairly ask you who are lovers of souls, who have eyes which do weep and hearts which can feel, to try my master's prescription and see if the most unimaginable, unmanageable devil whichever took possession of a human heart, be not driven out as the result of prayer and fasting in the exercise of your faith. The Lord bless you in this thing. And may he bring us all to trust in Jesus by a saving faith. And to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.
Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.